Welcome into the sanctuary of the City of Refuge Christian Church of Northwest Indiana. The Bible says in John 8.32 that you should know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So get your Bible and follow along as Pastor Pernal brings forth the words of life. But we know that Nehemiah had gotten news that the walls of Jerusalem had been broken down. And we know that he went through this process of crying out to God. He went through this repentant process on behalf of his people and on behalf of him and his family. We know that he had went through this process of ensuring that he was aligned up and that he was delighting in God. He went through this process when he got to that place of repentance and ensuring that he was lined up and that God was delighting in him to where he put an ask out there to his king for resources, for favor to do what God called him to do. And everything that he asked the king for, God did it. And so then what we didn't cover, we'll cover in a couple weeks, but that he began, he went to Jerusalem, he got there, and he went on some solo trips to, to spy out the damage that was going on and to see what was there and he began to see the problems, and he didn't communicate it to anybody. And you got to understand that there are some things that God may have you doing that you can't talk to other people about it too prematurely. He didn't talk to the princes about it. He didn't talk to the leaders about it. He went and he saw a problem. There's things on my mind that I have not talked to any of you about it because you wouldn't be able to handle it. And Evangelist Jones many times is the only person in church, pastor, and she'll ask me questions. And those that I want to answer, I answer. Those I don't want to answer, I don't answer. But she'll, she'll just straight out ask me questions. And some of the questions I answer, some of them I don't. I don't mind the ask because they're not bad ask, but some, just because somebody asks you a question doesn't mean you have to answer it. Y'all not working with me. And so he went and he went alone and he did some things where God can only show him these things. When I went to find a church for the Maryville, I didn't talk to these guys. I just went. And when I went and found it, I brought back to them because I didn't want them telling me about how much it was going to cost. Because <laughs> Elder Learner is good for that. <laughs> He'll tell you in a minute, you know, that's costly. <laughs> you know, I didn't need nobody telling me how much something was going to cost because I know that God's pocket is deeper than the need. And so we went from two fifty dollars a month to 2500 a month or 2700 a month within a month. But God never missed a bill. God is a provider. There's some things that I can't share with you, nor did Nehemiah share. But he saw the problem. He was planning. He was doing some things. And then he went before the people. And the people said, you know what? We're going to get behind what you're, going to, what you're doing, Nehemiah, because we see the graces of God on your life, and so the people begin to do the work. But this is where we are today. I, I didn't want to, there was a buildup, but just to give you a background so that what we'll get to today makes a little sense to you. So in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, in New King James Version, it says, But when Sembala the Horhite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Gershom, the Arab, heard it, they laughed at us and despised us and says, what is this thing that you're doing? Will you rebel against the king? So verse 20 said, so I answered them and said to them, the God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we his servants will arise and build. But you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. That's important because I shared with you two weeks ago that these two individuals had a Jewish heritage in their background that stemmed from Lot and his daughters, and that they should have been supportive of the Jewish people and Hebrew people, but they were not. They became opposers and enemies to their own people. Y'all not working with me. But, but what they were doing as Nehemiah and his people was working, they was trying to distract them. 
And I want you to know that as you are putting your hands to the work and you're carrying out your day-to-day -day lives, the best you know how, I want you to know that the enemy has dispatched demons to distract you. And distraction can come in many different forms. It could be a sickness. It could be a vocation. It could be whatever it is that confronts you. But the enemy is trying to distract you to cause you to lose focus on what God has called you to do or cause you to lose focus and confidence that God's word can do what the word says and to have you focusing more on that distracting spirit than the promises of God. I could stop right now and go home. A distraction is something that distracts. It's an object that directs one's attention away from something else. I want you to know that our attention should be daily on the word and the promises and the purposes of God. Primarily, over everything else, our distractions should be on the word, the promises of God, the call of God that's on your life. That's where all of our focus should primarily be every day. That's why Colossians says, set your affections on things above and not on things here on the earth. Your affections and your purposes and your desires should always be uh, on a higher level. But life, demonic spirits and distractions will cause you to take your focus from here to down here and it leaves you in a frustrating space. It leaves you in a fearful space. It leaves you in a space that doesn't move you forward in the things of God. Proverbs 4.25 in the King James, New King James Version says, Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right before you. You've got to keep your eyes and your mind and your focus stay straight ahead on the things that God has said to you about you on the things of God has said about life and how to maneuver life, you got to be stayed focused on that on a daily basis. The Amplified Bible says it like this, let your eyes look directly ahead toward the path of moral courage and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you toward the path of what? Integrity. Psalms 86 and 11 says, teach me your way, Lord, and I will live by your truth. And then it says, give me an undivided mind. To fear, to reverence, to be in awe of your name. See, the distractions have come into the church, not to just the city of refuge. When I say church, I'm talking about the universal body of Christ. So I don't want y'all to think that this, this is just, I'm talking about the body of Christ. Distractions have come to divide your mind, your attention, and your purposes. You don't believe me? Take a self-inventory of your thought process last week. <laughs> see, see, I don't have to prove nothing. I want you to take a I, I want you to take a, a inventory of what's been going on between your ears over the last seven days. <laughs> let's don't go back a year let's don't go back six months over the last seven days and, and, and I can guarantee you my next paycheck which is not very much that there have been distractions that will come in to try to divide your loyalties can I teach it uh, uh, the, 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 the message bible says it like this train me God to walk straight then I will follow your path, follow your true path the true path. See, distractions try to come to pull you off the true path. Put me together with one heart and mind. One heart, one mind. Look, then undivided. I will worship in joyful what? Fear. This is not something new. The first sin that entered the world came because of a distraction. <laughs> to divert the attention from what God has said. In Genesis 3, 1, the devil used the serpent. I said the devil used the serpent. 
I said the devil used the serpent. The serpent was not the devil. I said the serpent was not the devil. The devil used the serpent. Like the devil can use stuff to distract you. The stuff is not the devil. The devil used the stuff. The person is not the devil. The devil used the person. The situation is not the devil. The devil used the situation. We, we, we got to understand that. It, it, it says in Genesis 3, 1, the serpent was the shortest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, did God really say? That's the distraction. Did God really say? The word says you heal. Can I really have the healing that the word says I have? The word says that you're this. The word says that you're that. Well, is that word really effective in your life? Did God really say that about you? That was from somebody else. Did God really say? That's a distracting thought. That's a thought that would bring an a, 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 a undivided heart and mind. That's a thought that will cause you to question that if God, can God do what God really said he would do? See, I, I don't doubt anymore that God can heal. I was sick to the core one, one morning in Hawaii and it was a Sunday morning and I wanted to go to church. And I began to sing a song that says, I am the God that healeth thee. I am the Lord, your healer. I sent my word and healed your disease. At that moment, the fever broke, the headache broke. Everything that was bothering me broke, and I was able to get up and go to church. So you can't tell me God is not a healer because I've had a personal experience with healing. You can't tell me that God won't heal because I've seen my wife down to 119 pounds to nothing but bones with stage four cancer where I could see and feel her ribs. I could see her hip bones protruding. Then I could see life being poured back into her body. You can't tell me God is not a healer. There is no distraction when it comes with God healed. Six months ago, I could barely use this arm and I didn't tell nobody. Didn't tell my wife, didn't tell my mother-in-law, didn't complain to no elders, didn't complain to nobody. I continued to walk around, could barely carry five pounds. But I said, Lord, the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. I will sit up here and praise God, and I could barely raise that right arm. I said, well, by your stripes, I'm healed. But then today I can pick up a pallet, I can throw a pallet, I can pick up 50 pounds, do whatever it is I need to do because God is a healer and he's not going to cause me to be undivided in my ability and distract me to have me question, can God really heal? Your disease is special. You know, your disease is special. I don't know if, if yours fall under that healing thing. Can God really do? That's a distracting thought. You got to be undivided, one mind and one heart to know that God can do what he said he can do. Some of us walk around distracted because we, don't, we, we have a, a divided heart. Come on now, y'all ought to work with me. Am I talking, did I, did I supposed to save this for Okinawa? Did God really say, you must not eat of the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? That was a distraction from the true path. Too many people have been distracted from the true path. Do you not understand in Luke 9 and 62 in the Amplified, it says, but Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hands to the plow and looks back to the things left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. Distractions will cause you to pull back on your faithfulness to him. 
not faithfulness to people, on your faithfulness to him. And there's somebody on the camera, not in here. You, you, you're thinking about, you, you, you play with the thoughts. You know, hmm, I'm tired, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, 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 I'm not going to do all of that anymore. No one that puts his hands to the plow and looks back to the things that's left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. See, saints, we can't have divided loyalties. When God put a mandate on your life, it is not optional any longer. As far as God is concerned. We can justify it. We can rationalize it. We can dress it up however we want to dress it up. It's still a sin of omission. You didn't go drink. You're not committing adultery. You're not on drugs. You're just not doing what God required of you to do. Distraction. Distracting thoughts can cause you to slack your hand for what you was born to do. This is good teaching here. God doesn't want us to look back. I'm, I'm, I'm going to skip Genesis 19, 17 to 22, but, but you should do it. But it's dealing with when God delivered Lot and his family out of Sodom and Gomorrah. The scripture said to him, don't look back or stop anywhere in the valley when you leave. C- come on, that, that, I'm going to read it. So when they got ready to be delivered out of Sodom, they received some instructions. So it says in, in, in Genesis 19, 17, when they were safely at the city, one of the angels ordered, run for your lives and don't look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. Oh, no, Lord, Lot begged. You have been so gracious to me and saved my life. And you have sown such kindness. But I cannot go to the mountains. Disaster would catch up to me there. And I will soon die. See, there is a small village. Say small village. There's a small village nearby. Please let me go there instead. Don't you see how small it is? Then my life will be saved. I'm going to go back and come in on that a minute. So all right, the angel said, I grant you your request. Really, that was a test a lot. I'll grant you your request. I will not destroy the little village, but hurry, escape to it. For I will do nothing until you arrive there. This explains why the village was known as Zor, which means little place or insignificant. Lot taught us something in this part of in this portion of scripture. Because when Lot and Abraham, they had so much stuff that had to be divided, Lot looked out and set, and set his tent toward Sodom because it looked like the most promising space. It looked like it was the more greener grass. It looked like it were more opportunities. It looked like it was the greater uh, opportunity. And so he went to that, and that's what happened to Saint. We look at something that looks like it's better. That's a better church. That's a better job. This is a better that. And then you run to it and you find yourself when you get there that it wasn't everything that it appeared to be, but you're stuck there. But Lot learned a lesson. This time he said, oh, no. I don't, I'm not looking for the bigger stuff. I'm not looking for the mountain that appeared to be the safest. Send me to something insignificant. He went from wanting something that looked like it was the best to just being okay with in little insignificant situations. He learned his tent. When are we going to learn our lesson? We keep running for the big and the boisterous. Says the Lord, just whatever you want to, what you bless me with will be the best, no matter how big or how small. He said, I'll be safer in that most insignificant looking place. He learned something. 
But they had received the instruction, saints, and you got this instruction. Stop looking back and set your eyelids ahead and look forward. Amen? Second Timothy 4.10 says, Demas has deserted me. He got distracted. Why? Demas has deserted me. Why? Because he loves the things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. The things of this life distracted Demas. Demas was a, a very faithful supporter of the Apostle Paul. And all of a sudden, the things of this life pulled him out of the things of God. Saints, do not let the things of this life pull you. Y'all ain't working with me. I said, don't let the things of this life pull you. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. I'm skipping a, I'm skipping a whole lot of <laughs> verses there, uh, Deke, to get to this. Matthew chapter 4. I'm almost done. Because I got so busy yesterday, I haven't packed one sock for the trip. <laughs> I haven't packed one sock. I had planned to pack, but after going to Costco three times, and are y'all working with me? You at Matthew four? Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For forty days and forty nights he fasted and became very hungry. I'm reading in the New Living Translation of Matthew 4.1 and 4.2, Matthew 4.3 now. During that time, the devil came, said distraction. During that time, the devil came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. How many of you know that's a distracting thought? How many of you know Jesus knew who he was? And the devil said, If you be. I said, that's a distraction. He told Eve, hath not God said. He told Jesus, if you be. Jesus was with the Father when they kicked his tail out of heaven. Jesus knew who he was. You know who you are. Why do you keep entertaining stuff that says that you are not who you say you are? Y'all ain't working with me. Tell these stones become loaves of bread, but Jesus told him, no. The scripture says people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. What did Jesus do? He didn't look to the right. He didn't look to the left. He kept his eyelids focused on what the word says. No. Some of us sitting around here with the temptation, well, maybe. Then the devil took him to the holy city of Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off, for Scripture says he will order his angels to protect you, and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Say distraction. The devil was 90% correct in what he was saying, but he, missed, he put this Scripture out of context. If you read Psalms, it's either Psalms 90 or Psalms 91 where this scripture is in right context. But the devil misconstrued the scriptures in talking to what? Jesus. And Jesus responded to scripture also say, you might, must not test the Lord thy God. And that's the part that the devil misconstrued when he was talking to Jesus. I'm not getting ready to test God. Lord, I thank you you didn't deliver me from alcohol so now I can go to the bar and just hang out and drink water. Mm -hmm. Lord, I thank you didn't deliver me from crack cocaine, but I like my friend. I'm going to just go hang out. I'm just not going to use. you tempting God. God, if you don't want me to go where I'm going right now, cause my car to run off the road. He's not going to do that. That's a matter of your will. And God is not going to circumvent your will. He's just that loving and kind. He's not going to 
Take them to your will. Next, the devil took him to the peak, and this is this gets us. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Look at what he says, verse nine. I give it all to you, he said. If you'll just kneel down and worship me. You know what the distracting thought is? I give it all to you. You make a commitment, then the devil says, no, I give you this. Don't come all the way out. I make this available to you. I give you this. And you know what we do? Oh, okay. So we compromise. Because the devil said, the people, it's not the people, it's the devil. I give you this. If you do this. So all of a sudden your heart and mind is divided. Your loyalties are divided. From what you said you wanted. What you said you was going to do. Okay. I give you this. Because how many of y'all know all sin is selfish? I, I appreciate this church for taking good care of me. Because the world pulls on me a lot. Would you come work for us? Would you come do this? Would you come do that? No. I give you this. No, you won't be giving it to me. I like being harassed by Mitchell three times a week. Well, I don't mind to bother you. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> and we talk taking care of Emma House and the cafe. And I haven't lost commitment of getting out of that cafe. I give you this. No, you won't. I'm out of there as soon as I find somebody competent enough and got people skills. You ain't giving me nothing. At some point, I'm giving back, and then they're going to start something else, and I'm going to get out of that because the work is out there. But what get us is I give you this. I promote you. And so the devil dangles those carrots out there. And without thinking, you take it. Wow, I could drop a pin now. Be quiet. Those are distractions. All distractions that come are not necessarily majorly sinful in appearance. It's only sinful when you let them pull you away from your purpose and your what you committed to. Distractions don't have to be sinful, say. What? Y'all quiet. Y'all ready for me to quit? No, I got to go back. Distractions. How do we avoid distractions? Psalms 119.15 says, I will meditate on your precepts and thoroughly regard your ways. The path of life established by your precepts. That's what Jesus said. Every time he got tempted, he went back to the word. He went back to the precept. He went back to what the word of God says. That's how you avoid distractions because they are going to come. The New Living Translation says, I will study your commandments and reflect on your ways. The Message Bible says, I will ponder every morsel of wisdom from you. I attentively watch how you've done it. If you want to avoid distractions, you do it the way you've seen God do it. You respond the way you've seen God respond through the life of Jesus. How did Jesus respond when people mistreated him? How, how, how did he act? You can look at the Gospels and see how Jesus responds to life. And then you do that because when you don't now, there's a distraction pulling you away from the flow of the Holy Spirit in your life. Distractions. Matthew 6 and 24 says, no one can serve two masters. Here we go again. Not having an undivided heart. A, a divided heart. You got to avoid that. You got to divide, have these divided loyalties. Either you're going to serve God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and body, or you are not. No one can serve two masters. You will hate one and love the other. 
You will devote, be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and you can't have divided loyalties. If you want to get all of that principle, read Matthew 6, 24, all the way through 34. Proverbs 4, 25 says, look straight ahead again. I read it earlier. Fix your eyes on what lies before you. Keep your eyes straight ahead. Ignore. Look, I like the message Bible for Proverbs 4.25. It says, keep your eyes straight ahead. Ignore all sideshow distractions. Classroom time. All sideshow distractions, we got to let them go. Stay focused on what God has said. A lot of things that come and confront you are sideshow distractions. That's right. That's right. And before you, before you know it, you're totally out of where God wants you. And you, this is a dangerous thing with us with Christians. Nobody knows that we're at the wheel but us. Because we look pretty good in the presence of each other. Man judged the outward appearance. God judged the, and you know good and well God told you some things and way to do things and you're not doing it and nobody knows but you. There's a whole lot of internal sideshow distraction. You know how I test that in the church? Any of you that's ordained, I'll tell you any moment, hey, can you preach for me Sunday? And then you giggle at me. Hee hee. Hee hee. Every one of you in here, a leader that's been trained, should have been able to preach today with a 15-minute notice. You know why? Sideshow distractions. You've let life pull you away from what you committed to say you was called to do. I love to preach. I could preach every Sunday, but I have to grow you up. And then I come to you and say, well, what are you going to preach today? I need for you to preach. You got 15 minutes to prepare. Well, I need at least a month. Sideshow distractions. Nobody knows that you haven't been studying right but you. <laughs> I should be able to call every minister in evangelism here right now and say, I need you to preach in five minutes and you should be ready to go. You know why? You let life distract you from what God called you to do and you accepted the, or the, or the appointment. Slide show distraction. It got quiet in here again. <laughs> and I he 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 with you. But that gives me an assessment of where you are. Pastor I always gotta mess them up. Proverbs 425 says in the Amplified Bible, let your eyes look directly ahead toward a path of moral courage, and let your gaze be fixed straight in front of you toward the path of integrity. And in closing, we can't get distracted. Why? Because John 9 and 4, the New Living Translation said, we must quickly carry out the task assigned to us by the one who sent us. Who sent you? The night is coming, and then no one can work. The Christian Standard Bible says, we must do the work of him who sent I, uh, we must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. The Amplified Bible says we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Message Bible says we need to be energetically at work for the one who sent me here. Working while the sun shines. When night falls, the work day is over. What stops us from that are distractions. Distractions is one of the biggest problems with the church today. Not the city of refuge. I'm talking about the church. The body of Christ. That way you know I internalize like I'm fussing at you. I'm not. This word is for those on camera, those not here, those that can't even hear this word. If you don't believe me, just assess life every day. You'll see that people are messed up due to distract, distractions. And so all of us need to deal with distractions. And if it's pulling you out of the will of God, pulling you out of the purposes of God,
pulling you out of what you should be doing for the kingdom, deal with it. Just deal with it. Amen. And if you deal with it, there's blessing on the other side of that. Oh, yeah. Y'all working with me? All kinds of blessings. Not just financial, because we that's where our minds first go. The blessing of having peace and sleeping good at night without worrying about stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? That's a blessing when you go to sleep at night and not worry about stuff. Right? That's a blessing. So thank you all for your time today and, and attention. Um, I pray that God has said something to encourage you, not pull you down, tear you down but something that will have lifted you up, amen, to give you some to do for the rest of the week. And so please keep us up in prayer. Keep yourselves up in prayer. Continue to support. Do pray for Ari. Um, I was talking to her earlier this morning on text. She said, it's a bummer. This is Kenzie's last day in town, and I can't make She was so bummed out. Uh, she wanted to be here. But let's continue to be family to each other. And, and support each other. Amen. Let's do those things. As we tithe and give offerings, we are believing God for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and good surprises, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessing and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of my financial needs that I may have more than enough to give to the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Just like some of you have testimonies, I got a piece of mail in the picture. I think it came just last week. It says you have a 